Hello and welcome to this video and this video is going to be called something like the origins of jazz in the way that I see it, what I think happened. It's a big mystery in the previous video I mentioned it's a big mystery we haven't really got a clue you know how jazz develops um, but uh, America it's, it's an American form of music right America is based upon two opposing things really it's a based upon a sort of declaration of rights which is a liberal declaration which is really based upon the in individual and everyone has a set of rights and we respect our own rights we expect everybody else's rights i think this is one of the great you know achievements of mankind is is to come up with these liberal ideas i think they it revolutionized human history you know and really projects us into the technological age we live in now you know where we don't die at 30 you know and we don't have to work you know 24 hours a day, seven days a week to subsist, you know, it was uh, those liberal ideas. And America is based upon those ideas, you know, of individuality, you know, of not being a serf under some, you know, lord who basically owns you. You know, America's built on that, but it's also built on the back of slavery. It's built, built on the idea that a capitalist country thought it, at the time it was okay to, you know, go and grab people you know, like you own them and take Africans across the Atlantic and stick them in, you know, awful conditions where they were basically owned by these white, you know, American, you know, slave croppers or whatever, um, you know, and, 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 and in that they were, um, you know, totally owned and that experience of having that, their culture taken away from them. This is really important that the, 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 the slaves had their culture taken away from them. the slaves that went down to South America, their culture wasn't taken away as, as much. And so in South America, you see a, um, a direct marrying of Spanish music and African music together. That's Latin American music. You know, they didn't have their instruments taken off and they weren't forced to become Christians and forced to learn hymns. You know, that never happened, you know, but it happened in America, you know, I, I, and this experience we could talk about for hours. But what I want to point out is these two things. Now, I think this liberal idea of individuality being written into the American Constitution in the end saved the day. You know, the slaves were free because there was contradictions in that, that they, you know, and I think when science showed the fact that, you know, African people were exactly the same as every other person on the planet and they had the same rights as everybody, you couldn't continue like that anymore. Right, but that experience of having that culture take you off you have been completely subjected. Then there being a huge war, and then you being sprung out into this new country, right? And uh, what happened, I think, is that African culture had been really repressed. But down in towns like New Orleans, it had been less repressed. So in Congo Square, there's these stories of you know, slaves coming together on a certain day and being able to play their music and it, and it was like a little seed. But I think you can't underestimate the ingenuity of Afro-Americans, the, the incredible creativity of being able to ma maintain their culture, which is over hundreds of years of slavery, to maintain it as a thread. And then when the slaves get some degree of freedom in, in the mid 1800s, they are, an, are able to then wind it in to the music that's around them, uh, which is like folk music and it's like marching music and classical music. Now, down in New Orleans, um, after the Civil War, there were actually orchestras. There were Creole orchestras and black orchestras. There were a lot of musicians that were highly trained classically. This is something that does not get mentioned in the history so much. But suddenly you have really highly trained Afro-American Afro musicians and Creole musicians and they and then of course America then brings apartheid back in with the Jim Crow laws and these people are no longer able to work in orchestras and so they're, they're forced into minstrelsy which means they have to um, entertain people white people are predominantly by drawing upon this appropriated idea of Africanness. Right, but that ingenuity is there, and it's mixed with the techniques that come from marching music and comes from classical music, 
and the instruments, of course. And so I imagine that these musicians that are sort of rudderless, they can't go back to play African music, they start to create other forms of music and they create a ton of other forms of music. We, we know that they create the blues, they create ragtime, they create marching band music, but, you know, all these different types of music. And I think what happened was you've actually got lots and lots of different types of music going on. I don't think the early jazz musicians would have called themselves jazz musicians. They would have seen themselves as say, uh, folk musicians, but they're playing a folk music that's never existed be before. Or folk musics, actually, because there's lots of different things going on. And those folk musics are fusing. Um, it's, like a, it's like a new career actor in America. And I think the thing that, that I would like to throw in the mix, my personal thing is, is that subjugation and the, the, the awful experience of slavery, but also living in a country where you've got the American Constitution, is what's interesting is, is that jazz ends up embodying a new form, a new way of playing music, which is um, really based upon a democratic process where you have to act in the group, but your individuality is allowed to come out fully, where you express yourself, where your story is written by a composer, but you can change the story. You're no longer a serf under a lord, like a classical musician is under a classical comp composer. Jazz embodies that idea of individuality. Um, the idea that anybody can play this form, you know, Yes, jazz is an, is an Afro-American form. It's come from the African experience, but anybody can play this form. This is an incredible thing. You know, if I'm a jazz musician from England and I walk into a club where they play jazz in, say, I don't know, China, and we sit down and play a blues, there's a language there that I am actually allowed to partake fully and I can express myself fully regardless of my race. This is, this is an incredible thing. This, the gift, the gift that Afro-Americans gave to the world of creating a music that anybody can, can be involved in, that will just take any idea in and it's like a new character, it takes those ideas and then you go bang, bang, bang and out comes new forms of music. It's, for me, it's the greatest art form of all time as I, I'm sure you would guess, you know, and, um, so this is a really incredible thing, but what the hell's go actually going on around about 18, 19, 1900? We don't know. But um, certain credible musicians emerge. You know, uh, around about 1900, there's a cornet player called Buddy Bolden that has a, a band in New Orleans, and he seems to be a little superstar in his town. And I think it's around the time that jazz is being used to describe this form of music. Of course, that name, jazz, the, the music it's describing is no is not Ornette Coleman or John Coltrane or Duke Ellington. It's a completely different style of music, you know. Um, but um, people start to emerge. There's a guy called Freddie Keppard. And Freddie Keppard is a, a trumpet player. He was very um, worried that people would copy him. A lot of these early jazz musicians were very distrustful of recording. And so when... Uh, Recording came along and offered to record him. He said no. He didn't want anyone to see his flash fingering on his trumpet, so he didn't do it. You know, recording is so important in terms of the um, history of jazz, right? Recording is invented around about 1860, 1870. You know, what's the first thing they recorded? Well, it was somebody saying Mary had a little lamb, and then they recorded bits of Shakespeare, and then it took them a while to realise they could record music. So they, what, what are they going to record? Like opera, classical music, or, or you know, the the music of the ruling classes. There's no way they're going to, you know, go to the depths of America and record the folk forms there. They start recording folk forms, all sorts of things, but they don't think of recording jazz. But at some point, somebody gets there and they record some jazz. And in 1917, we get the first jazz recording by the original Dixieland Jazz Group. And this, is, it sells. Now, the original Dixieland Jazz Group was a white, um, or the original Dixieland Jazz Band was a white group. So by 1917, this music's established enough that white groups have come along and they're, they're trading on it. You know, they're, they're making... They're doing gigs playing this style of music. We've had, jazz has already developed by 1917 and we haven't got a clue what it was. That's the truth. 
But I think you, you can argue that once it was recorded, it changed it forever. And the reason for that is, is because the things that jazz um, pioneered, which I've talked about in a video previous, which would be improvisation, um, an individual voice, having an individual voice, and um, groove swing, you know, having a sort of groovy feel to it. I think once that was recorded, what recorded is it embodied it. It, it like nailed it into an actual composition. So if you listen to the original Dixieland Jazz Band, they're using some really way out techniques on there um, where they're, they're really impersonating animal sounds on that record. Right, so that's the first jazz record. Now, do musicians, um, you know, do they use that now? Well, they do. It's right through the history of, of jazz, and we'll get into it. You know, the use of non-musical sounds from the instrument is just a huge thing. It's one of the things jazz pioneers. Here we have it really, you know, in a, in a concentrated form on this record. And those sounds become the composition. Classical musicians were never able to do this. So recording suddenly makes it into an art form. It's often said that all the art form ever is, I think Frank Zappa said this, the art form is just a frame you put around something. You know, you, know, you, you can, um, you know, it's like you, you could have a crack on the wall, you know, that's not art. If you put an empty frame over that crack and it forces people to look, that becomes then an art, a piece of art. Um, a, a, exactly the same time that the original Dixieland jazz bands recorded their stuff, Mar Marcel Duchamp is putting a urinal into an art gallery and changing the face of jazz. All this cultural stuff, right? The culture's about to change. This is something that never gets mentioned in the history of jazz, right? If you look at someone in 1905, they're pretty much the same type of person as they were in 1875. But if you look at someone in 1925, everything's changed. It's changed because of technology. They're going into a te technology, technological modern era. It's all about airplanes and fast cars. It's all about the, the First World War, where a sort of Victorian army marched into an industrialized, you know, um, theater of war and got an annihilated by machine guns and bombs, you know. It, it, it's, it's, people come out of the 1910s in a different place culturally. They want something different. They want something that is a, about the modern age, that reflects that. As suddenly these jazz records are coming out, right? And these jazz records push a button in people and they love them. It's, it, I think it's got something to do with individuality, it's got something to do with groove, and it's got something to do with improvisation. All those things, I think, were probably really important attributes if you were going to get through the 1920s. Especially groove. You know, if you think of the 1920s, it's, it's suddenly, it's a girl with, you know, a little bob and a little short skirt, and she's dancing on the back of an aeroplane. Right, that's the suddenly we're in, and what goes with that? Caruso, classical music? No. It's something with a pulse and a beat and a groove. It's, it's, it's about hedonism, enjoying yourself. It's, it's, it's all those things suddenly become really, really important. The jazz records start to sell. They're selling loads and loads and loads. And I imagine whatever sort of musician you were that in, in, a, in the American South or in the industrialized North, you know, you could have been playing all sorts of things. You know, you could be playing like folk songs, ragtime, you know, bits of classical music, dance music, you know, all those sorts of things were going on. But if you're a, a musician at that time here in the success, you're going to look at it and go, oh my God, this is working. Well, I'll do that. You know, so when you look at the great virtuosos that, are, that, that emerge from the invention of recording, we can suddenly hear these virtuosos. We can marvel at their amazing, you know, technical and compositional and artistic ability. Right. Um, when you first hear those, okay, through recording, it must have been an incredible shock to hear that. Who are those people? Well, I would say Sidney Bechet. He's one of the great virtuosos, one of the great improvising geniuses of jazz. I would say Jelly Roll Morton. Jelly Roll Morton is a Creole musician that really pioneered 
how you structure jazz. It was really important to the way you structure jazz, how you use improvisation, how you utilize that individual sound. But when you listen to Jelly Roll, you can hear he's, he's, he's playing songs and folk music. You know, there's a really incredible interview with him that they did just shortly before he died. And you can check that out on YouTube and listen to him. He's, he's delving into all sorts of, you know, the blues and folk and classical and all sorts of different music. And he's, he's got a real deep understanding of classical music. He's, he's a virtuoso pianist. But the great virtuoso that is uncovered by recording is Louis Armstrong. Now, Louis Armstrong um, emerges out of King Oliver's band, and King Oliver is, is a direct link back to those really early jazz musicians of the Buddy Bolden era. King, king Oliver is called King Oliver because he was the king of jazz. He was, he was like the, the fir one of the first great superstars. But in that group, he got this protege. And, um, you know, Louis Armstrong was a genius, an absolute genius. I think Louis Armstrong's the most important musician of the 20th century. He's the most important musician in terms of um, popular music. His trumpet playing, the way he plays trumpet, the way he organises his solos and, and the way he organises the music that he solos over is going to influence every single instrument, right? So if you're playing the drums, you're going to play the drums like Louis Armstrong sounds. If you're playing trombone, you're going to play the trombone like Louis Armstrong sounds. He, he is a phrase innovator. And it's interesting to actually uh, look at Louis in isolation, because there's loads of incredible musicians in the 1920s that I could cover. But for the sake of this video, I'm really going to just talk about Louis Armstrong. He's the greatest. And if you, if you want to just go and buy, you know, um, one album, that represents this sort of early jazz, 1920s jazz, then you go and get the Hot Fives and Hot Sevens by Louis Armstrong. And what do you hear on that? Well, you hear someone playing popular songs of the day. But when he plays it, he doesn't actually play the tune of that song. It's really incredible how he could play Summertime, for example, and Summertime goes, ba da 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 <laughs> <laughs> See, this is what happens when you do these videos. Now I'm swinging that a little bit, and that comes from Louis, because that's how Louis swang sung it, but they're the notes. But Louis Armstrong doesn't have to go, ba ba da, ba ba da 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 da. He might go, summer time, and the living is easy. He could do way better than I could do it, because he's also got that voice. Lee Armstrong has not got, you know, when we talk about jazz musicians and, um, you know, individual voice, God, that voice of Louis, you know, a singing voice, not just a trumpet voice, it revolutionises popular music singing, absolutely revolutionises, it's incredible. And yet he uses like, he'll use like, in, in one phrase, you will get like uh, jazz improvisation, sort of arpeggiating through the chord changes. You will get sort of classical cadenzas, cadenzas, you know, these sort of, you know, real soloistic passages. He will play extremely long high notes or really fast short notes. But more importantly, he uses noise and sounds within that. And he'll do this really organized. You can hear him almost play. There's one idea. Here's another idea. And, and he will ref he can play a melody without referring to the melody. I, 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 I can't really get into the, the, the full genius of this guy and the ramifications that Louis has on, on music. I think um, the way he played was so influential that whatever you played, you were going to change the way you played because of Louis. Right? Um, those first early jazz groups are basically like, they're like marching groups, you know. So there's a front line, you've got like a trumpet playing, you know, the tune. We've got a trombone playing the sort of underlying counterpoint bass part and then a clarinet sawing over the top playing all these twiddles. That's the front line. And then it's, it, it's, it's augmented by, you know, marching instruments pretty much. You know, like, so it's, it's what are called drums, which are really bass drum and snare drum. You know, it might have a piano there, you know, that's the instrumentation. But once Louis comes in, the lineup and the instrumentation starts to change. So if we just talk about the drums, which obviously I, I, I know quite a bit about, the drums are basically three marching instruments. It's like the bass drum, the snare drum, and then 
the clash cymbals, those what that's what you'd have in a marching band. And so what you see with the drums is a, is a, like a bass drum, you know, your snare drum, and then these high ups here are like the the, uh, the 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 clashing cymbals that you get in a marching band. Of course, this is these aren't invented till the nineteen twenties. The um, the hi hats, but and I'm going to do a video on the history of drums. We'll get into that much more deeper. But the point is. Is that military drumming that is underpinning early jazz? That swing, that pulse, that phrasing, you know, that type of phrasing comes from these great virtuosos, and especially Louis Armstrong. So if you're a drummer in the 1920s, you're hearing Louis and you can't not play like him. And Louis was brilliant at playing at breakneck speed, but sounding like he wasn't. So there's all these things that Louis Armstrong pioneers. So by the 1920s and the Hot Fives and the Hot, hot Seven recordings by Louis, suddenly these great statements have been made and it's, he's turned jazz into an absolute art form, which is um, equal, if not better, I would say, than classical music in terms of what it can do. And he's been recorded and those recordings are out there and that's gonna have a great effect on the musicians out there. In the next video, I really want to talk about the effect of Lee Armstrong and those early musicians had on the development of virtuosity in jazz. But for now, I will finish there. Thank you very much. And if you enjoyed this video, you know, like and subscribe. And if you want to know more, go on to the next one where I'll be looking at the development of virtuosity in jazz. Thank you very much.